Hi, my name is Janice Chi, and I work on the metaphysics of action and mind and its relevance for our theoretical understanding of civil liberties. So I'm currently writing a book on this topic titled A Theory of Civil Liberties, Speech, Assembly, and Religion. And in this book, I defend a robust view of these core civil liberties against what I call the standard interpretation that these freedoms are generally protected as forms of human expression. So my project, I think, is significant for our understanding of truth for a few reasons. I'll discuss just three. And I'm going to focus my comments on just the idea of free speech, since I think speech seems to be the best paradigm for our modern emphasis on expression. So the first reason this is important for a concept of truth is that it seems clear that our, the standard interpretation of civil liberties must be false especially if we think that the values of the activities they protect is based on the fact that they should be productive of some truth or meaning for our lives. And so the problem is this, that mere expression by itself is actually compatible with a failure to be productive in precisely this way. So that's to say the standard view assumes that speech is reducible, both descriptively and con conceptually to forms of expression. And on this view, the core civil liberties that constitute modern democratic societies are primarily protections of ideas, beliefs, opinions, assertions, sentiments, or viewpoints. But the mere expression alone of these sorts of utterances do not by themselves produce truth or even approach some societal consensus about a disputed question. So a second reason I think we should care to define civil liberties beyond their merely expressive effects emerges from considerations about evolutionary biology, actually, and our place within the natural world. So Aristotle, famously in The Politics, begins with the observation that many of the other animals are what he calls gregarious or sociable. So bumblebees dance, whales sound off, wolves howl, songbirds twitter, elk bellow. And this is just to say, by a few examples, that lots of other animals are expressive. So expression is not actually unique to us as a form of human communication. And on this point, Aquinas in his commentary on Aristotle's politics offers, I think, a useful distinction between two forms of communication, one that he calls locutio and the other which he calls vox. And vox is a mere vocalization or expressive communication, a capacity that we share with the other animals. Locutio, in contrast, is uniquely human speech. And what makes locutio distinctive is not so much that we are able to share our sense experiences through it or our emotional states or even our statements of intention to act, to share these sorts of this kind of content with other members of our species. Animals, in fact, do precisely all of these things through vox. Locutio, in contrast, is the power of articulating our perceptions of good and evil, our understanding of the concept of justice and injustice, and other theoretical subjects that human beings, particularly philosophers, like to discuss. And so Aquinas says, communicating these perceptions produces households and political communities. So it's clear that on Aquinas and Aristotle's account, this distinction is important for any account of civil liberties and its relation to truth because it shows what is unique about us as rational animals, and it affirms the idea of free speech as a distinctively human power. After all, I think it would be really strange if our political constitutions went out of their way to enshrine as human rights any powers and activities that actually belonged essentially to non-rational animals. So speech, understood as locutio, not vox, is a core civil liberty because, as Aquinas argues, it frees us to live in civil society with one another. And it does this precisely because it alone defines the power of rational discourse, of communication that is not just about exchanging information or expressing something, even if these expressions can be very advantageous within a species community, but it's about seeking or being open to a rationally discursive response from others. And it's this that can be productive of truth in a much higher sense than just giving and receiving information. It's a concept of truth that aspires to understand the meaning of things for the sake of our living together as human beings. So the third reason this account of speech as rational discourse is important for the concept of truth is that it allows for moments in which we need not offer a belief or opinion at all sometimes, for the advancement of productive discussion. In fact, it is crucial 
for a coherent account of rational discourse that sometimes instead of uttering statements that may or may not be true, we instead ask questions. So the, I, I really think the role and concept of a good question seems very underappreciated in today's modern debates about what free speech is. And the philosopher of language, Paul Grice, half jokingly pr proposes a new kind of speech act that he calls the operator of coercion, in which the speaker does not so much make an assertion as offer the possibility that an assertion could be made. And yet this is a form of real questioning that allows us to be more thoughtful and discursive in our intellectual explorations of truth. It allows us to propose without commitment. And such non-committal speech, it turns out, is essential to successful discourse and its propensity to lead us eventually to the truth of the matter. Well, that's all I'll say about this for now. Thanks for the opportunity to express my thoughts, as it were.